Get the latest democracy and voting rights news with Democracy Docket's free daily and weekly newsletters. Click the link in the upper right-hand corner or in the description of this video to subscribe. Welcome to Defending Democracy, Congresswoman Crockett. <laughs> Thanks so much. I'm excited for the conversation. Uh, I just tweeted here recently about Jamie Raskin being the GOAT. Uh, but when I think about democracy and I think about the person who is on the front lines every day, uh, there is no one who deserves the title of the GOAT more than you. So thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you very much. Um, now, before you ser served in public office, uh, you were a public defender and a civil rights attorney. And yeah. I'm just curious, how did you transition? What made you decide from going from that <laughs> to running for public office first at the state uh, legislative level and then Congress? Why that transition? Um, first of all, I miss the courtroom every single day. I think it does come out a little bit uh, in some of the oversight hearings. Um, that I do miss the courtroom. I do miss an opportunity to be in front of juries. Um, but when you're in a state like Texas, a, a state that has 30 million people, and when you're licensed in multiple jurisdictions like I am, um, as far as states as well as on the federal level, you start to question really how much change are you effectuating? Um, am I doing the most that I could be doing with the privilege that I've been blessed with um, to actually have this law degree? And finally, I got frustrated. Um, you know, when you look at the areas of law in which I was practicing, there's nothing but frustration, whether you're talking about the hashtags because someone has been killed or whether you're talking about just the injustices in the mass incarceration and who typically is on the receiving end of that, um, you say, is it enough to just represent one family or one defendant at a time? And you figure out what more could I be doing? And that was really um, what led me to run for the state house. I, I can't say that I was super ecstatic um, to to throw my my name in the hat, but um, I felt compelled. I felt like this was where I needed to be. And we're glad you did. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, we're obviously glad uh, that you ran for the state legislature and then ultimately ran for and won in Congress. And one of the things that I know you have spent a lot of time on and did when you were in the legislature uh, was dealing with the fact that Texas is so hard to vote. Like people don't realize who are not in Texas. You know, they think, oh, yeah, Texas is like a little more conservative than where I live. And maybe the voting laws are, you know, a little more conservative. I mean, Texas is more of a balanced state in terms of partisan makeup. But its voting laws are extremely, extremely limited. Um, it's 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 one of the most anti voting states in the country. And I'm just curious, from your time in the legislature, you know, I assume you got to know your Republican colleagues some. What, what is motivating them to be so terrible <laughs> in the voting laws they passed? I, I think you know the answer to this question all oh, too well. You know, when you don't have policies that will get you elected, you decide that you're just going to cheat to win. And that's essentially what it comes down to. Um, you talk about being balanced. You know, I am always the, the crazy auntie uh, at the cookout when I say, Texas is blue. Believe me, Texas is blue. And people always want to look at me like I'm crazy. Um, but as you know, we, we recently went through redistricting. And it became clear that Texas is a majority minority state. Most people don't realize that. Texas also has more African Americans than any other state in this country. Most people don't realize that. And when you do look at it, uh, we do have voter apathy, which is something that we struggle with in the United States in general. Um, you know, I was just having a conversation earlier today uh, about the fact that some of my colleagues have been overseas um, right before an election. And here in August, I was overseas right before there was a large election that was going to take place in one of the countries. And it always amazes me and dumbfounds me at the same time when I hear that they have voter turnout in the 90th percentile. 
These are numbers that we never see in the United States. Mm. Um, and to think that we are the home of democracy, we are the originators of democracy. Yet, I guess we've gotten to the point that we've gotten apathetic about democracy. And I think the work that you do every single day um, as you are in court after court is fighting to preserve a democracy that unfortunately um, we've gotten to the point that a lot of people don't recognize how much was given just for us to have this right. And we're talking about in countries where you only get one day to vote and they're still turning out. I mean, I talked to people that said, listen, I fly to my home country to make sure that I cast my vote. Um, and so when I look at the state of Texas, um, it is frustrating for a lot of reasons because we do have voter apathy. But as you said earlier, we have voter suppression and it is very real and I don't really care what the other side has to say about no, you know, people just need to get their IDs or they need to do this or they need to do that. Um, but, you know, when we're living in a state like Texas, where they said, you know what, it is too difficult for people to um, go and get a gun license. We just want everybody to have guns, right? So give everybody guns and that'll kill somebody, right? But when it comes to voting, oh, no, 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 let's make that as hard as possible. Like make it make sense, right? So um, it's not about doing what's right. And I think that that is where you see the degradation of democracy is when you don't have people that believe in doing what's right. It's not necessarily about whether or not you win or lose your race. In fact, when we went through redistricting in the Texas House, um, they didn't know that I was going to be running for Congress. I didn't know at the time that I was going to be running for Congress, but they were so mad at me calling them racist over and over and over for the crazy lines and the crazy lies and the crazy laws uh, that they decided that they wanted to draw my district in a way that they thought that I was potentially not going to be able to win the district. And I told them that it wasn't about me and it should never be about the individual in the seat, but it was about the people and what they were doing, in my opinion, to my district, which was, or uh, yeah, it was, it is a legacy district, is they were violating the Voting Rights Act. And so I said, hey, do what you're going to do. I'm going to make my record. We'll see you in court. Um, but we still had enough protections in my seat that I felt very confident that if they did what they were planning to do, that there was going to be a violation. After they realized that I wasn't going to play with them about making a solid record, uh, they decided to, to do right by my district. Um, and I'm sure they were so excited when I ultimately uh, didn't even run for the seat. <laughs> and instead ended up becoming the Congresswoman. So this is, I think, a really important point you're making. And I wanna back up here and just- All right, give me one you... second. I'm just... unable to hear you. Sure. I'm getting beeping in my ear. We all are. We all are? Huh, you can't hear me? I Try now, cause I, the beeping stopped. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. can Go ahead, sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So this is a really important point you make, and I want to sort of sit on this for a second and talk about this because it's we hear so much about redistricting and the motivations and why lines move this way or that way and maps and this law and that law. But you reveal something here that we so little hear about. They tried to target you because you were calling them out. Right. It wasn't just you're a Democrat. It wasn't just they want, you know, this highway or neighborhood in Virginia. Just a, this was personal. And I don't think yeah. we hear that enough that when these legislatures draw these lines, some aspect of what they're doing is like political retribution. So talk about that. Oh, absolutely. Um, and, and Texas is king for the nonsense. So essentially, we had gotten to the point that we were getting nothing but bad bills, um, whether it was, as you mentioned earlier, whether it was voting bills, and it wasn't just SB1. Um, we had a ton of voting bills that were going down from them trying to kick people off the rolls. SB1 obviously was a really big deal because this is where we talked about the fact that they 
didn't want uh, souls to the polls, right? Like they wanted to get rid of that. And honestly, everything that worked in Harris County to increase voter participation, they saw that as a threat and they decided, wait a minute, we want to undo that. We never had limitations on the hours that you could vote. Um, it was always up to the county administrator as to what the hours would be. And so what they decided is they were going to have mandatory hours um, within which you could vote. And that actually extended hours in a lot of the rural portions of Texas, because a lot of um, the rural areas, they actually weren't voting in those later hours. And if you can imagine, rural Texas is not half as populated as urban Texas. And so those administrators would decide that they were going to have their polls open throughout the hours that they could actually staff them, throughout the hours that they could really see uh, a good number of people show up. But when you start talking about large urban centers, we know that, I mean, literally, we've got cities that don't sleep. Whether we're talking about the fact that Harris County itself is a health care um, uh, center, right? We have the largest... Um, Oh, the largest cancer center, I'm sorry, uh, that, that exists there. And so we literally have a huge medical center. We have these medical professionals and we were talking about the midst of COVID. And so we've got people that are working 24 seven. And so they decided, you know what? We can staff it. We're going to do it. We're going to make voting convenient. And it's, it's the convenience that frustrates them, right? This is when the working class is able to participate. Um, it's kind of like our tax systems, right? They only want to look out for a certain group of people when it comes to voting. Um, and so when it comes to drawing lines, we see that, you know, I, I hate to bust people's bubbles and think that um, because I'm sure that they believe that our elected officials aren't petty. But uh, have you seen the guy that is running to be the president again? I mean, listen, these people <laughs> are elected, but that doesn't stop them from being petty and ridiculous. So we had them targeting me because I uh, was very vocal about the voter suppression that was taking place, um, as well as I pushed back on the terrible law that they ultimately passed which was the vigilante law um, going after women uh, as it relates to reproductive mm -hmm. access. They wanted to make sure that there was a $10,000 bounty on women's mm -hmm. heads uh, that decided that they needed reproductive care. Um, and they went after trans kids. They did all these crazy things uh, in addition to open carry, in addition to limiting the powers of our cities to make decisions about their budgets um, because they were allegedly pushing back on uh, the defund movement. And so I was vocal on all these issues. So they decided, you know, we have one good protection in our Texas um, constitution as it relates to redistricting, and it only exists in the Texas House. In the Texas House itself, you're not able to go outside of the county lines. So they're stuck. So I'm in Dallas County, and they're like, we ain't got too many ways to draw this. Like, we can't make it Republican. But when I said it was a legacy district, um, it was actually the first African-American district that was drawn in Dallas County. And so my district um, has seen some fluctuations. We, it's the same thing you see in most inner cities, right? Um, we see that there's a different demographic that's moving in and that kind of stuff. Um, but because it was protected, it, it was supposed to continue to enjoy the protections. They decided that a district, I think at the time of my lines, we knew my district was in the 40th percentile African-American. Um, and so we really needed to bump it up a little bit to be able to survive for the next decade. They decided that they wanted to bump it down. So I only had maybe 17% Anglos. They decided that they were going to bump it up almost to 40%. So they hmm. thought, well, you know what? Maybe the white people won't vote for the black girl. So I was like, listen, y'all can do whatever y'all want to. I'm going to win this seat. <laughs> no matter what happens, um, because when I speak, I speak truth to power. And it's not just about the fact that I'm a black woman. I'm looking for fairness. And honestly, that's what Democrats stand for. Um, but you can't do this to this seat because it's protected and you're going to run into a problem. So that's what they decided to do. People may not remember that they also decided that they were going to pair the two African-Americans in Harris County 
um, that were members of Congress. They decided to pair Sheila Jackson Lee mm -hmm. uh, with Al Green. And so it was interesting because I remember having a conversation with a Republican colleague. Um, and I said, listen, y'all know this don't make sense, right? Like, I, I, literally, we're, we're standing there, we're on the floor, but we're standing off to the side at the window. And I, I, I turned to this colleague and I said, I mean, I don't know how y'all think y'all gonna get away with this. Like, like, tell me your secret. What is the secret sauce? Because, like, you know, this will never, like, pass. Like, there's a lot of egregious things that you can do, but you're not going to make it on this issue because the state of Texas had grown by 95% of the growth was due to people of color. We had only added 180,000 Anglos in a 10 year span. And so I was like, how do you justify adding a new Anglo seat? And for people that don't keep up with all the numbers, our districts are 766,000 people. Texas was able wow. to get wow. two Think new about that. districts. And they decided, not only are, in, in African Americans, we added, I want to say about 500,000. I think it was half a million African Americans that we added. So clearly, we probably could have justified adding a new African American seat. Instead, they decided, no, 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 we're going to take one of yours away and, and we're going to go ahead and add yet another Anglo seat. Like, this is how they do math. Right. Like we we know on the national level that the Republicans are bad at math. But just so you know, they're bad at math on the state level, too. Uh, it wasn't adding up. And so ultimately, this Republican colleague says to me, he says, you know, the people in my district hate her. So we're just going to have to do this. And I was like, this is insane. It's like, I don't care. The people in your district can't even vote for her. He wasn't from anywhere <laughs> near Houston. And so I was like, I, so he's like, I, I can't vote to unpair them. And so essentially what we had to do was, it, it was crazy, but we got them unpaired. But uh, on record, they look like they voted to keep them paired. It, it, was, it, it was a mess. So basically they changed so their vote after the fact. So one of the themes that I have been trying to uh, convey to people, because I believe it to be true, is that there is such a, in what seems to be insatiable, and in my view, irrational demand by uh, the, the, the news media, by even some Democrats, to find this mythological moderate Republican this Republican who is reasonable on democracy issues. And so I sat through, you know, I think it was the Paxton um, impeachment, and people were saying, oh, well, you know, the Republicans in the Texas State House, they're reasonable, the speaker is a moderate, and they're reasonable. And, and what was it like for you to, 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 to be in this chamber while people are trying to do backflips to say that somehow, you know, not all the Texas Republican state house figures are really MAGA, they're not really extreme. Because to me, that is as dangerous for democracy when we do, when we define down what it means to support democracy to that you're not like in favor of a violent insurrection, that anyone not in favor of a violent insurrection is somehow a moderate. I think it does real damage. And you saw that firsthand there. And now, obviously, you see it in Congress. Yeah. So what I would say is that I, I actually agree with the sentiment a little bit. Um, I think the biggest problem is that we have a lot of cowards. Um, mm. If you get them into a private conversation, um, they will tell you. I mean, it's it's like the things that Liz Cheney uh, has recently written about, right? Like they will right. admit the truth, but they're cowards. It's like the fact that we're dealing with this Santos explosion. They don't want to have to take the vote. They're like, we don't want to have to take a difficult vote. What is difficult about voting to expel him? Like, I, I'm, I, like, I'm curious. Like, it's not difficult. It's not hard. It's not hard. We have all the evidence that we need. Um, and, you know, despite what he believes, he's gone through due process. Um, in his mind, there's only one kind of due process. It's the one that's about to send him to prison. Uh, you know, it, it, that's not what it is, right? Like, and so what we have is a lot of cowards. People that are afraid of being the next Liz Cheney or the Adam Kingsinger. Mm -hmm. uh, they are afraid that if they do the right thing, which means that you're looking out for democracy, that you won't get reelected. And I don't think that democracy can really 
uh, hold if this is how we conduct ourselves. And so they continue to vote for policies that they know are harming um, their constituents, that are harming maybe even themselves. I mean, I remember asking a, a colleague one time about a bill in the state house, and I said, you realize like you're affecting your own pockets, like forget everybody else's pockets. Like you understand like this harms you too. And he's like, yeah, but I'm afraid of the fact that if I don't do it and Abbott gets mad at me, then Abbott will spend loads of money against me because we don't have any limits for donations. And mm -hmm. Abbott consistently sits on no less than $60 million at any point in time. And he can pick up the phone and he can call one of these oil tycoons and say, hey, I need you to drop a million or two million against this person. Um, that's not what democracy looks like. I mean, this is why when people start talking about the threat that the orange guy presents, you know, I, I need them to understand we, we got some other little people that are trying to turn orange too. Um, and that, that includes the Abbots of the world. That includes, um, you know, the one in Florida. I mean, like it, it includes all these people that are basically um, puppets. And, and so we've got a lot of puppeteering going on. We've got a lot of cowards. But I will say that if I pull some of them to the side, now I'm not talking about the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world and Boberts. It's only so far I can go with this conversation. But there are a couple, right? Like, in, in fact, um, a lot of the Republicans that you see that are retiring right now, they don't want to deal with it. They're over it. Most of the Republicans that are retiring are the ones that are like, this is too much, right? Um, now, granted, they did vote for our current speaker. And I'm like, listen, if y'all were going out, go out with a bang. We, we could have really had some history. Y'all could have put Hakeem Jeffries in and, and then we could have got some things done in the Congress. But, you know, they, they didn't want to go out uh, <laughs> that loud. But I, I would have welcomed it. You were just alluding to the change in speaker. Um, if you look on the merits, you know, just on the the record, um, Speaker Johnson is more conservative. He was, I wrote for Democracy Docket that uh, he is arguably, other than the former president, uh, the elected, the federal elected official with the most culpability for January 6th. Uh, because, you know, he was one of the ringleaders. He was the ringleader in the Texas lawsuit, the lawsuit Texas brought to try to throw out the votes of four states, you know, throw out my team and I litigated that for uh, President Biden and the DNC and won, thankfully. Um, but he was the ringleader who got 120 plus Republican members of Congress to sign onto a brief to throw out the entire elections in Georgia, Wisconsin, um, uh, Pennsylvania and Michigan, uh, literally the ringleader. He was in communication, we know, with the president, the former president. And I believe that that effort to get those Republicans in line on that brief was the sort of the core group of what then we saw the night of January 6th, where they continued to lodge objections. So in my view, Speaker Johnson is, you know, not only no friend of democracy, but a real threat to democracy. And I'm just wondering, given your, given from your vantage point, having seen the attack on democracy, both from Texas in the state legislature, where you were a hero, an absolute, people who don't know the full story, Congresswoman Crockett was a hero. She oh. led an effort. You know, you talk about people sacrificing. You sacrificed to try to prevent SB1 from going into effect. SB1, one of the worst voter suppression bills in modern history, uh, uh, limited early voting hours, established new ID requirements, empowered partisan poll watchers, created new obstacles for voter assistance, and this against a backdrop of a terrible, a, law, a state with terrible voting laws. And you led the history, the, the, you led the walk out there to try to do everything you could. I always say to people, do whatever you can at this moment in history, and you did. But but Speaker Johnson was on the other side, right? He was enabling the insurrection. I'm just curious, as you serve now with him, you know, what do you make of it? You know, um, again, we keep having these warning signs, and I, I don't know what it's going to take for America to wake up. 
Um, I know that the other side is always against people being woke and it's probably because they don't want them to um, understand just how many threats and how close to the ultimate power and how we may see a shift that is literally going to take everything um, that we were founded upon away from us, right? Like we continually see that we're losing rights every single day. Um, and we continue to lose these rights because of the guy that was uh, president at one point in time. Um, and, you know, most people, when they think about going in to vote for president, they're not thinking about, well, what type of person will they put on the Supreme Court or what type of person are they going to put on those trial courts or that Eighth Circuit? What's going to happen there? Like no one votes that way. Right. Like they are typically saying, hey, do I believe that this guy is going to give me more money to eat or do I believe that this guy is going to give me less money to eat? Like it's it's typically around those things. And it, it is very difficult to convey to Americans, especially Americans that like, for instance, myself, I wasn't a part of the civil rights movement, um, but I was taught about it. Another thing they don't want to do. I was taught about it um, and I understand it to an extent that I fear that we could be walking into um, yet another civil war. Um, I remember that uh, when I was running for the state house, I said, we're in the midst of a modern day civil rights movement. Um, and so we've got the civil rights fight. We've got the civil war that, you know, I argue is, is partially taking place right now as we see um, this heightened level of division in this country. Um, and most of the division that we've seen, it's actually been instituted on the political level. It is politics mm. that is played into mm -hmm. dividing us. Um, and so, you know, my heart aches for my country. I serve in Congress because I do want a more perfect union, because I do believe in the promise of America, um, because I do want future generations to have an America that they can be proud of, and because I do want America to still reign supreme in the world. But unfortunately, just like when we take our oath, we talk about the enemies um, that are foreign, and we talk about the enemies that are domestic. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, I feel as if not based on personalities, not based on party, but there are people that are clearly what I would characterize as enemies that are domestic. These are the people that continue to push the, push the disinformation. They push all the lies and they continue to tear us apart and divide us instead of bringing us together. One thing that I don't think many will ever have to say about President Obama while we saw so much division, more so just because he was a black man, he never promoted hate and anger. Mm -mm. He always promoted hope. And hope. right now, all we get is more hate and more anger. And I mean, you can go down the list of everybody that they hate. I mean, from their policies to what they actually say, it, it's a matter of we hate everybody, everybody that makes America uh, the beautiful place that it is, is, is what we consistently deal with. And I do believe that, that they are doing a really good job with the distractions, right? Like, let's talk about Hunter Biden and impeachment. And it's like, I'm sorry, he's not president. He's never been president. He's not been in any position that would subject him to that. So it's like, let's do this over here so that people can focus over here and talk about that while at the same time, we are literally tearing down the institution. Um, you know, right now they want to say that George Santos is the problem. He ain't. I mean, here's the deal. It, he, he's the low man on the totem pole. I mean, y'all not really <laughs> mad at George, right? Like, you can't really be mad at George and at the same time saying that Trump is the bomb.com. I mean, like, I mean, they're one and the same, except like Trump is like the advanced version. Like, Santos is like in preschool. Trump, more like in college or grad school, right? Like, so, I mean, the inconsistencies um, tell you that it's not really about, like, what they do, but they know that Trump can ascertain the power. And when he gets the power, they know that he will do the things. He will make sure the minority rule 
is what we endure in this country. I argue that, you know, we're here right now because we're dealing with minority rule. You have um, people that have cheated, and I know you know this better than I do. You had these state houses where they cheated, and Democrats still overperformed, which was like a miracle, right? And so they cheated with these crazy lines so that they could then end up in the majority, and then they don't know what to do with the majority because then they've got this even crazier faction that continues to pull on them so they can't do anything. I mean, it's, it is minority of minority rule. Like the things that they're pushing for, the policies that they're pushing for, they're anti-democratic. And that's why you see the people pushing back when and where they can. Look at Ohio, look at Kansas. We can't push back like we need to in the state of Texas because they won't allow us to do our own ballot initiatives. Because if we did, I could ensure you that Texas is a lot smarter and better than what our representation looks like. So I know you have to go. So I just want to ask you one final question in the last uh, minute or so we have left. You mentioned President Obama. Um, I had the I had the uh, honor. I represented Senate candidate Obama, or Senator Obama, and my law firm, and I uh, did work for President Obama. And I think you know I'm 54. I think objectively, by any measure, he is the best president of my lifetime. And as you point out, he preached constantly through the the good times and the bad times, um, a, a message of hope and that we could all change and be better than, than we, we are. We, we have lived with the specter of Donald Trump now for a while, and I think it's made a lot of us fearful and a lot of us resistant uh, and a lot of us tougher, uh, but I'm not sure it's made us more hopeful. So what gives you hope? Like when you go into the House chamber today, when you, you know, look at your you, you look at your staff when you meet your constituents, like what gives you hope? It's, it's my constituents. It's the people. Um, I know that the policies that I'm pushing for are policies that will improve American lives. Um, and when I say American lives, that's everybody. Um, I'm not looking at rural or urban. I'm not looking at black, white, Latino, um, Jewish, um, Iranian, um, but you know, I, I'm not looking at it that way. I'm looking at what can I do to make lives better in this country. And when I go home and I talk to my very diverse district and they tell me that they're proud of me, they can run down the list of the things that I've done. Um, that's what gives me hope. I believe in the power of the people, um, looking at the elections that we had most recently and seeing the resistance and seeing the pushback and seeing that the people are really trying to tell their elected officials, you are not representing my interest, but this is where you come in, right? If you wouldn't have to have, you know, these huge um, elections and, and have people collecting the petitions and things like that, if we had real representation that was reflective of the people's will, um, you know, we, it feels as if we don't have a representative government on any level right now. Um, I, I'm proud to say that, you know, they kind of used my district um, to, to commit more heinous crimes in the state of Texas. Um, but overall, I do feel as if I have a coalition district um, that generally speaking, feels as if the work that I'm doing meets their needs. And that's what representation looks like. And so for me, it's always the people. Um, it is a tough job to be here, especially in this time. We are making history for all the wrong reasons. And unfortunately, the rest of the world is watching us. And unfortunately, much of the rest of the world is watching us is starting to laugh at us. And some of the rest of the world is starting to say, and we told you democracy wasn't the way. That's what our enemies are saying. Mm -hmm. That is what they're pushing other places. And so the work that you do every single day in court it matters not just here, but it matters abroad. It matters for this world. I don't think most people recognize that, but the preservation of democracy, and democracy doesn't mean that I win my elections. Democracy means that the election was fair. And so the fight for democracy is bigger than just what's happening in one state house, what's happening in the U.S. house, but it's a greater fight for democracy in the entire world. Um, so thank you for what you do. Um, I don't think we could thank you enough. Well, 
Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett, thank you for being here today. I will end with another another president. You know, uh, you talk about the lack of political courage by Republicans, um, and you look at your own career and the political courage you have shown. The political courage you showed in the House, in the in Texas, where you stood up um, against. Uh, blatantly unconstitutional laws targeting women's health health care, I think, dangerous precedent. Um, you stood up for voting rights. You, at great personal risk, and people need to understand that, at personal risk, at professional risk, led an effort to try to prevent the disenfranchisement of hundreds of thousands of voters uh, with SB1 and the other laws and the courage you've shown in the in the House of Representatives, you know, the courage you've shown to stand by your convictions, to represent your constituents, and to try to make America a better place for everyone, not just for for voters in your district, but around the country, the country. And in doing so, you make yourself a target, you make you hold yourself out uh, and people um, uh, are, you know, are, 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 uh, are always attacking from the other side. And so when, when President Kennedy talked about the importance of political courage in his book, Profiles in Courage, he wrote as a senator and then talked about political courage as president as essential to democracy. You know, the whole idea of profiles and courage was that, that you need members of Congress, you need elected officials to have political courage. And the courage you have shown in the face of cowardice, as you point out, on the other side is exemplary and should be an example for all of our leaders. So thank you for joining me today. Thanks for joining Defending Democracy and good luck. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to Defending Democracy. You can find all of the cases and articles we mentioned today linked in the description of this episode. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a review. To find out more and stay up to date on the latest voting rights and election news, visit democracydocket.com and subscribe to our daily and weekly newsletters. We'll see you next time. Today's episode was produced by Ali Rothenberg, Gabri Corporal, and Paige Moskowitz. It was edited by Paige Moskowitz. Defending Democracy is a production of Democracy Docket, LLC.